most expensive legal mistakes in your business. The reason we're putting this webinar together is because we see business owners make very expensive mistakes day in and day out in their business, all because they didn't talk to an attorney on time. We hope that this will be a good reminder that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Rita, to you. Uh, Rita, you can hear me, right? Yes. Good. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is Rita Lynn. Um, I am an IP attorney. I, um, I've been practicing IP law for over 12 years, and uh, I, my background is in engineering. I have a chemical engineering degree from MIT, and uh, before I went to uh, Boston University School of Law to get my JD, so since, since graduating from law school, I've been practicing IP law, and um, first starting out in big firm, Wall Street firms, so for the past uh, past four years, three, four years, I've been working uh, almost exclusively with smaller businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, uh, entrepreneurs and inventors, helping them protect their IP um, and help their business grow. Thank you, Rita. What I wanted to tell our listeners is that both Rita and I are small business owners ourselves. We understand firsthand what it means to run a business, sometimes on a shoestring budget. And sometimes we we have to prioritize and decide where the money that we earn in our business should be allocated. And um, for us, um, legal protection is a no-brainer because that's what we are trained to do in school. But for a lot of my clients, and I'm sure Rita would say the same thing, and that's the purpose of this webinar, for a lot of our clients, it's not the most obvious thing. And I have to say, there are, the reason for that is the proliferation of semi-legal information on the Internet. If you Google various legal questions on the Internet, you will get half-correct, half-incorrect answers, which give people this impression that they kind of have it covered, that they can get templates off the Internet, and they will be okay. And I am here to tell you that that is not always the case. In fact, more often than not, people who have used online non-law firm legal services end up paying twice or three times for the mistakes that they make originally, be it not filing the trademark application correctly, be it not publishing their LLC requirement. The mistakes are, they're just, the variety is endless. And it all is because from people not talking to the right person at the right time. My background is very similar to Rita's, and maybe that's why we uh, like to co-work together so much, is I went to law school here in Manhattan, Fordham Law School. I worked at a large, at a couple of large law firms doing initial public offerings, all corporate, all the time. Um, and to tell you the truth, I barely saw my real clients. My day-to-day -day work was really dealing with other lawyers and writing humongous, huge documents and really not being fully attached to the final work product. So in 2011, when I had a choice to start my own practice, the answer was obvious to me. I love human connection. I like to be helpful to the person in front of me as opposed to on the other side of the computer. And there was... There's no better privilege than to work for small business owners here in the city because that's what keeps the economy going. The small business owners in Manhattan or, you know, in New York City, they're the most robust, most inventive workforce out there. Uh, and considering that we're always constrained with our economic resources, we actually come up with very creative solutions to life's most difficult problems. So um, those are my dream clients. Uh, I love working with small business owners. I, you know, as I said, small business owner myself. And so this is really my um, sort of, and, and Rita's, contribution to the small business community, uh, teaching a little bit of what we know so that expensive mistakes could be avoided in the future. So what I'm going to do over now is to um, 
go to our agenda for today, which is to cover the top five most expensive mistakes. And after discussing, I mean, there's a million mistakes that you can make, but these are the top that come up more often, and they are the ones that have the most dramatic economic consequences for a small business. And they are, just to summarize quickly, are do not own, you do not own your business name, you sign agreements without reading, you give shares in your company to strangers without even knowing it, you use someone else's IP, and you do not protect yours. You allow personal bank accounts to be used for business. So those are the top mis five mistakes that we're going to cover today. And I'm going to now turn over to Rita so she can talk about the first mistake on our agenda. Okay. Um, so the first mistake <clears throat> excuse me, is that you do not own your business name. Well, you know, this problem is actually fairly straightforward on the surface. You know, you pick a name that someone else already started using. But it, it actually, the, the, the real legal issue gets more complicated because we're really talking about two bodies of law intersecting. You know, on one hand, you have corporate law, which dictates, you know, one name you can choose to represent your company and you have to register with the state. You know, on the other hand, you have trademark law, which is part of the IP protection, uh, which governs what can be used to represent your company in the eyes of the consumer. So when you incorporate a company, and Elena can probably go into this, um, she, is, she is the corporate attorney here, um, you know, you need to give this legal, legal entity a name. You know, different states have different restrictions, but generally you can pick anything to call your company. It doesn't have to be all that creative. Uh, it just needs, you know, it's any, it's like naming a baby. You need to name your baby company. You know, the state doesn't usually care <clears throat> whether someone else in another state has the name already, uh, is already using the name. So let's say you call your company ABC LLC and incorporate that company in New York. Um, and as long as no other company named ABC LLC is registered in New York, you can probably register. However, that doesn't mean that you're able to use ABC LLC anywhere in the country. Well, it, it's because, um, that's, this is where we get into the second body of law, you know, trademark law. Trademark law is to protect the goodwill or the brand recognition that a company generates. You know, a company might generate that brand recognition um, by spending a lot of marketing dollars, you know, the, the commercials you, you see on TV, the printed ads in a newspaper or magazine, you know, or by providing really good customer service every time a customer calls, they're wild at a customer service. Or, you know, just generally having really cool, really good products that people like and people want to buy. You know, whatever and however a company gets that recognition, that goodwill, <clears throat> is what trademark law is really trying to protect. So let's go back to the ABC LLC company, for example. Let's say another company owns ABC as a trademark, um, and, and people in that industry recognize the, the good work that that the company has been doing. If you start a company in the same field, same industry, ABC will most likely come after you when you start making your mark in the world and make you stop using ABC um, to refer to your business because, one, they're afraid that, that the consumers will get confused. You know, when they look at an ABC branded product, is it from them? Is it from you? You know, and so because they already have established that goodwill, that reputation, you know, the last thing they want to do is for you to come in and take all that goodwill and, 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 and that good reputation and for you to benefit from it. So you're most likely going to get a cease and desist letter asking you to stop using their, uh, their name, even though it's your name too, it's your legal name, but because they own the trademark, uh, you will be you'll be forced to stop using it. So, I mean, the, 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 crux, the crux of the problem um, that this, this, well, I should say, the issue really we're dealing with is the confusion that a, a, a customer might have. Is it ABC, the first company, or ABC, your company? Um, so, as the later user, like I said, even though you're able to register the name in, say, New York, uh, you will probably need to change your marketing strategy, even though 
legally you can use that name. But in terms of marketing, to do sales, or advertising, you know, to go up your own brand and your own goodwill, you will not be able to use ABC because it will cause confusion. And so without that ability to market your product, your, your service, you know, your name, really, how are you going to grow and increase sales? Um, uh, another another cost that will go into this this issue is that, well, let's say you already started marketing, that, you know, and without consulting a lawyer, you, you pick a name. Now you will have to go back to the drawing board and reprint all the business cards, the brochures, and whatever uh, literature or collateral you have already prepared. So um, I have a, a, a real example for you, I, I we had a client once. Uh, he owned a consulting company, and in his name, he used something something Intel. And um, he actually was in business for quite a while, for a few years, when he received a letter from Intel, the chip maker, uh, out in California, basically asking him to stop using his name because it has Intel. You know, within his within his name, um, and I think it ended up costing him about ten to fifteen thousand to totally rebrand his company. Um, to and you know, and I think he took it. You know, in, in this case, I think it, it turned out pretty good for him because he ended up negotiating with Intel and got some money to do it. But not all the companies are as nice. Um, and uh, as willing to work with you. And in this example, it's also a little different because, again, to the strength of the mark and all that. But bottom line is, <clears throat> trademark law, you know, um, it, it's used to protect the company's goodwill and reputation. And before you start putting a lot of money into building that up, you really need to make sure that you actually own your name and can um, can protect it. And, and be able to not only use it, but prevent other people who are coming after you, who create a company after you, from using and stealing your goodwill and reputation. So, you know, I put the cost at, you know, $1,000 and up, but it really is 1000 is the minimum because that's, that's about how much you need to file a trademark application. But if, if once you get started, you know, like I said, my client ended up spending about ten to 15000 to rebrand and to basically redo everything. So... So that that's you know is the first problem I think um, we see a lot Elena and I see a lot about not owning your name. Oh, I, if I could have a penny for every story like this, I'd be rich. Uh, you know, it's it's expensive rebranding, and we really mean printing printing new business cards, printing new marketing materials. I mean, that, we were talking about a lot, and then also changing all the domain names and going through all of your bank account designations, human time, um, just a lot of uh, paperwork. It, Absolutely doesn't have to happen. You know, get your name straight from the very beginning, and um, all of this expenses and the hassle will be avoided. Now, um, let us move into my uh, top priority for all of my clients. It's signing agreements without reading. Oh, my God. This happens over and over, and I'm guilty of it just with the rest of you. I am always so tempted to, if I like the person with whom I'm trying to work, I am just happy to say, sure, no problem. It's almost a personal accommodation for me to say, yeah, uh, let's go ahead, and I sign without reading, only to realize later that, especially the, those one-page or two-page agreements, to realize that those agreements are not protecting me or they are totally vague, potentially unenforceable, really and if things don't go well, which sometimes they don't, especially if people don't have good agreements drafted, it's actually a reflection in their general sloppiness in business in my book now. Um, if things don't go well, you go back to the written signed document and you realize there are no protections there. I mean, that is just um, – that's a tremendous cost for the business. Um, but the most – I didn't want to just go and say, like, that happens all the time. I wanted to bring home a very vivid example of something that happens quite often, especially if you work a, a, with somebody who's not based in New York, uh, therefore they're a foreign developer in India or Philippines where there's literally very hard for you to reach them 
um, jurisdictionally to have a lawsuit against them, right? Here in New York, if the person is based in New York, you can hold them into small claims court and get something resolved. But if if your counterparty is in another country far away, you're not going to be able to get your money back so easily. So what do you need to do? At least try to make sure that your agreement with that person is clear and there is some kind of a clause that says it will be resolved in New York. So here's an example. So a client of mine signed um, a, and this is, you know, public knowledge. It's really a fictional example that I'm using, uh, not ex the, the actual client. Um, so she signed a website development agreement uh, with this person, and she comes highly recommended. She's done a million of websites, and she has a very proprietary way of incorporating video and e-commerce, meaning you can, like, click on buttons and purchase electronic products right off the website. And my client is a published author, and she has a very charismatic presence, and so she wanted to make sure that her website was a vehicle for selling her video training, her book, uh, downloads of her book, and also the paper copies of her book um, so that people could purchase all of that with a click of a button with a credit card on her website. So she paid $10,000 to the web developer more than a year ago. And now it's been 13 months, and the website is barely functional. It literally looks like a, word, a barely adjusted WordPress template. The e-commerce functions do not work. The videos, um, they've been literally plopped in using YouTube's streaming channel, which is fairly unprofessional, and it you know, takes a long time to download for viewers. So it's not a great website. It's definitely not worth $10,000. And we started going over the agreement that this uh, client of mine signed. Turns out that um, the client does not have any ownership in the product in the website uh, that is being currently created. So even the half-finished product she cannot own because there is a license clause in the website development agreement. So all of the proprietary rights to the domain name, to the um, the um, the software code to the look and feel, the, the design of the website, everything is vested in the web developer. And the provision says that uh, even after the web developer gets paid in full, even after that, it will be a license. Uh, so basically, there would have to be um, an agreement renewed every year while the website is up, so the website developer will continue to get paid. It's a wonderful agreement for the website developer because basically she put up this, um, you know, product and she's going to get the stream of royalties for doing very little work. That's not the understanding that my client had in mind. She wanted to own the website outright and be able to monetize it, um, you know, basically in perpetuity until there is interest in that product. And that's not what's going to happen. We are now looking at a lot of different ways on how to invalidate the contract and get her out of that very unfortunate relationship. So what is the cost of the mistake? I mean, we are out of pocket for $10,000, and we're not even talking about litigation or attorney's fees that my client is paying to try and get this resolved. And unfortunately, now we are so far down the road, it's like, you can't really drop it. You know how sometimes the economists tell you that you have to uh, cut your losses and move on and st start from scratch? I mean, that's not an option for her. She can't just drop the domain name. She can't just, um, you know, give up all the content that's been created for the website. She needs to find out a workable solution for this to go forward. And um, I really do not wish to, this to happen to anyone. Um, and the other horror stories that happen is, let's say, you know, a web developer has a disagreement with a client and they put, um, put the website in this limbo where if clients were to, if customers were to look for your website, it doesn't even come up as if it's an active domain. I mean, that is just monumental 
blow to the business, um, and very few small business owners can afford having that kind of relationship and that kind of a, a situation with their website because um, that's money out of their pocket every single day. So that would be my number two most expensive legal mistakes, which uh, leads you, which leads us into mistake number three. And this one is about starting a business with friends or family or boyfriends and girlfriends and not having anything in writing. So basically, if you have nothing in writing and you invite somebody to um, – come up with a business idea and try and figure out the way how to make money together, which is basically sell a product or a service and then divide the, the profits among the two of you, that is called a general business partnership. What that means is that you have a fiduciary duty to each other to put the interests of the business first. A lot of people don't even intend this outcome. For example, I had a situation where, I mean, this happens quite often too, um, two independent business owners decide to come up, they decide to come up with a new sort of joint venture product. So one is, let's say, a massage therapist, the other one is a coach, and then they decide to create a series of workshops for uh, women in the city to um, do certain rituals. So as they are going through preparing those workshops together, they spend some money to promote the event, and then when the event actually happens, the participants pay the fee to be a part of the event that these two, the coach and the massage therapist, put together. So now these two people, they're in business together because they are generating money uh, from the audience, and they have some expenses together. That is a classic general business partnership whereby everything that they create together uh, is their joint property, and they owe each other a fiduciary duty. And if there's nothing in writing explaining how people are going to, like the, between the two of these owners, how they're going to be responsible for their share of expenses and the profits, if they don't have any agreement about uh, what will happen if they decide to not work together anymore, whether they can use this workshops individually, separately from each other, if they don't address that in writing, they're in for a very um, unpleasant situation down the road if one of them decides to not work anymore and the other uh, turns away and starts doing it on their own. Um, very often, situations like this resolved in litigation, um, especially if the enterprise starts making money. Um, and it's a, this is not a very simple litigation. This is actually called a shareholder dispute uh, slash partnership dispute. And in order to put up that kind of litigation in New York City, uh, you're looking at minimum $15,000 in legal fees and court filing fees before you even get into any meaningful judgment or ruling um, and kind of understand whether or not you're going to win or not. So that's a very large mistake, a very big mistake to pay if there's nothing up front. Um, another variation on this theme is that um, a lot of people – um, use the free services. They don't intend to go into business with another person. They basically just want to use somebody else's free services. That's not okay. So unless it's an internship relationship or um, it's a nonprofit, if people are working in your business for free, technically the presumption is, is that they want to be partners with you. So you really want to avoid that kind of situation and make sure the relationship is in writing. Um, so I wanted to move over to the next mistake that is, uh, I'm looking at the number and it's like it's an even greater magnitude and that's Rita's uh, favorite topic uh, and I'm being a little facetious here. Over to you, Rita. Okay. Well, 
so this mistake is that you actually are, you don't own your IP and you're actually using someone else's IP in your product. Well, this is definitely a scenario we see quite often, and it's actually a pretty scary uh, situation that we see, um, you know, your company or a company, let's, let's, let's be, um, let's not say you, let's say a company develops a product, you know, and makes a lot of money um, doing sales, and, and then um, all of a sudden someone comes out of the woodwork and sue them because uh, this company's product infringes this other company's uh, patent. Um, this other company doesn't need to make anything, but as long as they have the IP, um, they technically have the monopoly to to make uh, to, to make products embodying that uh, invention, that that patent invention. You know, patent infringements happen every day, and you know we hear about the big cases on TV like Apple versus Samsung, uh, Google and Apple, but you know smaller cases happen actually day in and day out. Which we just won't hear about in, in mainstream media. <clears throat> you know, litigation is, is quite expensive, especially patent litigations are sort of a, uh, a piece of its own. And, and um, it, it's, it's usually a very big problem for small businesses because if they're hit with litigation, even if you want to settle, it takes a lot of money to get to settlement. Um, and uh, a second problem besides the cost is that you know, if you're hit with litigation, you you might be forced to stop selling the infringing product or order to pay damages. So, so you know, a lot of things can happen when you are using someone else's IP. Um, what what can you do to protect yourself? Well, for one, you know, you can get product clearance searches done and ask your attorneys for for their opinion. Um, the search and analysis part, you know, aren't going to to be you. You can't take that to court and say, oh, but but I did this search, I did this clearance already, why am I getting sued? Well, the, the, the truth is, anybody can sue you, especially if you are making money and making a, a, a sort of carving out your territory uh, in the industry. You are always at risk of being sued. It's just that you have to be smart about it. And doing a search and clearance, um, you know, it, it gives you a better understanding of your risk. And that's, I think that's what... Uh, small business owners, you know, uh, even us too, we have to evaluate constantly what our, what our, what we're doing good for, not only good for our business, but also are we taking on too many too much risk. Um, and also, you know, uh, if you're developing a product, even if the product is not cutting edge and only includes like slight improvements of something that already exists, um, you might want to take a look at getting that uh, improvement patented. Um, a patent becomes an asset, and once you have a patent, you can you you become the one that has the monopoly and have the ability to prevent others from performing this that improvement. Uh, it also helps in litigation, believe it or not. Even if you um, have you know a, a smaller patent or you have a few a, a smaller patent portfolio, um, it, it helps you settle. You know, in reality, it does. You know, in most litigation settle, so how do you get a settlement? You negotiate. Well, how do you negotiate a settlement that both sides would like? Uh, a lot of times, you mean the middle, and you need something to give you leverage. A lot of times, companies settle by cross-licensing, for example. Um, but if you don't have any IP, you can't cross-license, and that means that whatever they demand, how are you going to come back and lower that price that they demand? So... So again, you know, IP not not using someone's IP is definitely an issue, and not only an IP um, is an issue. Not just in like you're not creating an asset class that you could, but also in terms of you know uh, defensively using it is in the case of being sued for patent litigation. So you know the cost. Uh, as you know, fifteen thousand minimum. I you know I I started that number. Um, Kind of similar to what Elena was saying, you know, lawsuits are expensive, and you know, between court filings and attorney's fees and just responding, you're looking at a minimum of fifteen thousand, you know, before you can get to any kind of settlement. 
Yeah. Well, and it also becomes quite dramatic on television, for example, when you see a person in the middle of a Shark Tank presentation and they have an amazing product that everybody loves and Mark Cuban is ready to invest and then he asks that famous question, and do you have a patent for this? And the person starts to waffle and starts to describe a very acrimonious lawsuit that's going on and how it was not pro properly protected. I mean, the person is then voted off the show immediately. Like, yeah. you have no patent, you have no business to speak of, especially if you're a product-based business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just add something, too. You know, when when, when companies talk about or are thinking about patents, actually patents can do more than that. Like, you know, Shark Tank is a great example. You know, investors love patents. You know, they, you know, I would say most of them don't understand the full extent of what a, you know, what a patent covers. But the fact that you actually are committed, because patenting process takes a few years. So the fact that you're committed in, you know, research and development and seeing this thing through, and that says a lot to, to, to investors. And investors like patents. They also like patent pending. So we have a lot of small clients, startup clients, that we use patent pending, and which means that when you file an application that's pending with the, um, at the USPTO, you can say your product is patent pending. So, you know, you don't have to wait the two years, you know, or two, three years to get the patent in order to to start selling um, or, or, you know, try to get investment. You know, just having that patent pending sometimes helps a lot. Yeah, this I cannot emphasize this enough. And uh, the other thing we always tell our clients, take everything out of your head and put it onto paper so people can see it, uh, whatever uh, proprietary information you have there, because that's how you create the best assets in your business. I wanted to move us into the last point of uh, the presentation, which is really um, – it really is talking about the business that did, did not go well, the business that potentially got sued and um, does not have a future because it doesn't have a patent and it got sued uh, for the patent infringement. So basically, as a business owner, you decide business is broke, I'm going to file for bankruptcy, and I'm not going to pay on any of the business obligations on the business's credit cards. I'm not going to pay the lease if I have to pay any. I am not going to pay for any other contractual obligations because the law actually in America allows you to walk away from business debts provided you follow proper formalities. And what do I mean by formalities? If you want to walk away from your business debts and not use your personal savings to pay your business creditors, you have to either settle directly with your business creditors for dollars on a pennies on a dollar and have a written discharge of your obligations in, on paper, in writing, saying that I, business creditor, will not sue you for any further outstanding amounts if you pay me X amount of dollars. So you really have to have that in writing for a settlement. And if you can't get that, if the creditor is just saying, no way we're going to settle for pennies on the dollar, you're a rich person, you're wearing a lot of diamond jewelry, there's definitely money in your bank account to pay us, and we're not going to let you walk away from the business debt. Well, in that case, the person turns around and files for bankruptcy, business bankruptcy protection. And business uh, bankruptcy laws are, you know, quite complex, and they generally, if you were, you know, to follow all the steps and the rules, will allow you to discharge some of the indebtedness without dipping into personal savings. But this is what you have to do. You have to make sure that while you're running your business, you are never at any point commingling business and personal, because if you are going to be commingling business and personal, you are opening the door for your business creditors to go after your personal stuff. And that includes, if you're married, your joint property with your husband, uh, the retirement account, and God forbid the business creditors are able to obtain the judgment against you for the outstanding debt. That judgment lien is going to be attached to your name going forward, and they will continue to renew it every five years. So if you receive an inheritance, if you come into unexpected wealth in your new business, those old business judgment creditors are going to be able to come and get it. 
So keeping business and personal is super important. And how do we do that? So a lot of people, when they form their LLCs, they kind of set it and forget it. They take the fine, fancy black binder that the incorporation company sends them, and they put it on the shelf, and they stop using it. They stop using the LLC letters after their name. They forget what their actual business name is. So they start signing documents, even though it's a business um, agreement. They sign documents in their personal capacity, meaning literally it would be, like in my case, it would be putting Elena Volkova and no um, PLLC or LLC attached to it. So that's the first very important mistake that people make. They basically forget that they have a corporate entity. I mean, some people don't even bother to file separate corporate re tax returns. Some people don't bother to open a separate business account. Some people, um, you know, on business cards on their websites never even mention the words PLLC, Inc. or Corp. So there's no way for the um, business creditors to know whether or not you're incorporated. And I, if I am the business creditor, if I am working with an individual, I am more likely to um, sort of know that, you know, that individual is, is good for the money because their personal liability is on the line. But if I see the magic words, the Inc. and LLC and Corp., then it means I have to do more diligence and potentially ask for prepayment or a letter of guarantee to make sure that I actually get paid. Um, so I want to make sure that this is something that we kind of put at the top of your our priority list and to the extent you're already incorporated, definitely, definitely use the magic words. And if you're not incorporated, it's never too early. As soon as you have the intention of making money in your business, it's time to incorporate. And I used to not say this. I used to not say this at all. I always said, well, you know, test it out. It's expensive to incorporate. It maybe is not worth it. I don't say that anymore. If you have the intention of making money in your business, incorporate immediately. Even if the business doesn't make money and you have to close it, you will still be able to write off the business expenses. But what most importantly, you will create the barrier between personal and business liability. And, mo and the other thing uh, for incorporation, this leads me into my probably the most heart-wrenching story of the day, is um, sometimes if you've already started a general business partnership with somebody, you don't even have a choice. You can't even incorporate because that would be taking the business opportunity away from the general partnership. So. If you were to incorporate right away and then the person was working with you without being paid, then you, more likely than not, you will be able to say that it was just a misunderstanding and there was never an intent to be in business together. So incorporation is helpful even in that sense. Um, so I just wanted to pause a little bit. I know we have a few people on the line and I wanted to open the line for questions. Um, you can type them in. I know there is, um, uh, yes, there is a Q&A. If you scroll down on your screen a little bit, there is a Q&A line, and you can type of your question or comment to us, and I'm monitoring the questions here. And you can also, um, you can also, I'm changing this into Q&A mode. You can literally now talk into your receiver, and I will, hear you. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. Uh, meanwhile, while we are waiting for the questions, I wanted to say, so we've covered the five most expensive mistakes today. And scary as they are, they don't have to be. Um, this is your opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with either Rita or me about what is going on in your business. What do you think is a dark, unexamined corner where you think something should be done, but you're afraid to talk about it because you don't even know what kind of worms you're sitting on? I still think it's important to talk to an attorney, and we're offering this conversation free, just to start the road by walking. Put your attention to something that is potentially a liability for you. And we might be able to give you advice on how to avoid those things in the future and how to mitigate the risk that you're potentially facing in your business. Uh, we would like to thank you very much for joining, uh, joining us on today's call. And again, I'm just checking to see if there are any questions. 
we're here to um, we're here to help you. Um, and Rita, I just wanted to give you a chance to um, to do some closing remarks. Um, well, I think you 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 pretty much said it all. Um, I think that you know my my recommendation for small businesses is always that. You know, you need to think of your attorneys as your advisors, and we're really here to, <clears throat> should say, to to not only work with you but also to help you grow. You know, so that's that's what we're we're here to do. All right, um, so we're going to wrap up for today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for dialing in, and um, we wish you much success in your business.